Welcome back everyone to another ESO build video. Today is going to be the update to the Simpler, the Stamina Templar for the Dragonhold DLC. Now this has been used quite a lot in the past, mostly because of its ease of use. It has a very static rotation. You can basically stick to the same rules throughout the entire fight, whether it's execute, the beginning, or in the middle. It doesn't make a difference whatsoever. But we're still going to kind of stick to that, but there are some very, very cool gear options, especially with the most recent update as well, with some new stuff coming in. Now, I'm going to go, obviously, into detail with everything. So if you do skip anything, it's at your own risk. But if you're interested and you want to understand how everything works, stick with it. It will all be explained. So first of all, we're going to go into the stats. We'll just pop a potion, first of all, and our resistance buff as well to make sure everything is showing. We are on 9.7k max magical, which is not that important because we have enough recovery to cover the one skill that we're using that's magic. We're on 15.9k max health. That can go higher if you prefer. 30.8k max stamina and 1,465 stamina recovery. Again, that can go up, but we'll get to that in a bit. 60.9% crit chance, which can go higher. And of course, 4.8k weapon damage, which ends up about 6.5 in trials. Our resistance buff, which just fell off which is in our rotation, which we'll get to in the skills, is actually allowing us to have a 21.7k spell resistance and 19k physical resistance. We are really, really strong as far as our resistances are concerned. That's insane. 64 points, of course, into max stamina, none into health or magic. You can alter this if you want, but just bear in mind that if you do alter your stamina amount, you will, of course, lose damage. So just bear that in mind. It's a risk that you can take if you want, but then maybe you just need the more survivability and you're willing to accept the fact that you'll drop a little bit. It won't be drastic, but it will change. Uh, we are using Artem Takeaway Broth and a Shadow Mundestone with Stage 4 Vampire. You can change this if you prefer. Now, the food itself, of course, can be altered depending on what content you're in, depending on who you're playing with. Because the Artem Takeaway Broth gives us a nice health bonus, a stam recovery bonus, a stam amount bonus, and a health recovery bonus. Health recovery is kind of void because we're Vampire anyway. But it gives you recovery and stats across the board. If you don't have this and you can't afford it, or you just don't see the need to buy gold food or even use gold food because it's a lot of resources to use, um, then of course you can use Dubious Kamaran Throne, which is the purple variation of this. It doesn't have health recovery. It doesn't have quite as high in the stats, but it's very, very close. Failing that, if you have a very, very good situation where your group is bringing higher scenes, they're bringing synergies left, right, and center, you have a master staff in there somewhere from one of your healers, you have lots and lots of different stam return, and your group is very, very good at helping you sustain as far as passive and active buffs are concerned, then of course you can use this flat food right here, which will give you max health, max stamina. And this will push your stats up to 18.4k max health and 33k max stamina. Sure, your recovery has gone down, um, even if you've got a potion running. That will push us to 884, but we can sustain stupidly well anyway. So there are quite a few more situations in comparison to other setups where you can actually get away with this food and you won't struggle with sustain. Depends on your race, depends on your situation, depends on the buffs available. But when we get to the skills, I'm going to show you another option for big ad pulls where we are not going to struggle with sustain at all. And you can use this food, It'll make you more tanky and you'll have a higher damage output. But for the most part, for most content, just for everyday stuff, especially if you haven't got all that shiny stuff with you, Artem Takeaway Broth is the way to go. Now, I'm going to go into the skills in detail. Again, you can skip this if you want, just like every other video. But if you do, you're going to miss out on information. So if you do ask anything in the comment section below that has already been answered, I won't be repeating myself. So it's at your own risk. Now, first of all, Power of the Light. This got somewhat buffed, which is very, very nice indeed. Now, this is in the Dawn's Wrath skill line. It's the third ability you unlock. Starts off as Backlash, morph it to Power of the Light. Now, this will go onto the target, like so. You can see the light above his head, obviously. And it will do initial damage when it lands. Then it will pop. And all the damage done to this target by you will be calculated up during that time. And 20% of it will burst. And this will go up to a maximum of whatever this is set at, depending on your buff. So at the moment it says 18k, but the more you buff, the better. And this can now crit. This never used to, but now it can. So instead of it going up to a flat sort of 21 to 25k, depending on your buffs, maybe even pushing to 30, this can now go way above 60. It's very, very strong indeed. And the whole time this is up, you will actually apply Minor Breach and Minor Fracture to the target for 9 seconds. So the ability lasts 6, but the debuff lasts for 9. So, as you saw then, it wasn't a massive hit at the end. But if you add damage to it, and then let it pop, much bigger. 
The more and more damage you do, the stronger that will be. So you have to keep your rotation up all the time. You have to keep this active. This will actually be used twice in our rotation, but I'll get to that in a bit. Next up is Barb Trap. Now this is in the Fighter's Guild skill line. It's a fifth ability you unlock. Starts off as Beast Trap, or Trap Beast rather, and morph it to Barb Trap. This is a physical damage over time with an instant attack at the beginning as well. So once it pops, it actually does damage straight off. Indirect damage and then damage over time for 18 seconds. While this is active, this will give you minor force, increasing all of your critical damage done by 10%, meaning that if we do crit, of course, we hit harder. Now, this can immobilize targets, but of course, if it's a boss, it can't immobilize it, but the damage will still apply, and so will the buff. All you have to do is that. Leave that running. Activate it every single rotation. It's very, very simple. Just keep that running. You'll get your buff, and you'll get your damage output. Now, this is a flex slot. Camouflage Hunter is here just for... Well, actually for two reasons. Mostly for the stats in the Fighter's Guild passive which we'll come to in the passive section. But there is a bonus to this. If you have a healer, of course, you'll have Combat Prayer, which is Minor Berserk, which will give you an increase to your damage, a flat 8% increase, in fact, across the board. So if you've got that buff, this is useless. But if there are downtimes, this will actually fill the gap depending on your position. Because if you are hitting the target and you are dealing the damage from their flank, which most of the time you actually are, this will increase your damage output by 8% by applying this bonus for 5 seconds every time you deal crit damage, and you will crit a lot. So in content where you do have a healer and there's downtimes, this will increase the uptime of the buff, and in content where you don't have combat prayer, you've got this anyway. So this is a very, very nice bonus. You don't have to have this on your bar. Again, it is just for stats. This is a gap filler, but also you can swap this out. Now, you can, of course, put on Repentance. Now, this starts off as Restoring Aura, morph it to Repentance. This is a free ability. While it's on your bar, you gain increased Stam Recovery, Magic Recovery, and Health Recovery. And any bodies on the floor, up to six at a time, if you activate this for each body you consume, you will actually gain back 3k Health and 3k Stamina. Our recovery with our rotation, without putting too many spoilers out there, is borderline infinite. It's very hard to run out, especially if you're all to your race, in fact, um, depending on food you're using. With the flat food, as long as things are dying, we basically can't ever run out of stamina. This is absolutely mental. So if you are in big, big pull situations and you're using flat food and you want to make sure that you never run out of juice, and you will heal your group with this, by the way. They don't get the stamina. You do. But you get a heal, and so do they. If you want to utilize this, you can. But if you're just going for flat damage output and you've got more than enough recovery, you can obviously put Camouflage Hunter on and leave that there. That is from the Fighters Guild skill line, by the way. Uh, just to note, since I missed that part. It's the third ability you unlock. Starts off as Expert Hunter, morph it to Camouflage Hunter, not the other one. That is a passive bonus for you for gap fillers and if the buff is not there. But for the rest of the time, you want Repentance. Now, one final swap out is, of course, Whirling Blades. You can change this if you want. This is in the Dual Wield skill line. Third ability unlock starts off as Whirlwind Morphit to Whirling Blades. While enemies are under 50% health, you can basically spin to win and do this. That's an error of effect execute if you want it. Be careful, though. It's expensive, so you may want a heavy attack, spin, heavy attack, spin. That is a choice. Again, you've got three options. If you want to go flat single target and fill the gap with Minor Berserk, if you don't have it, or if it's down occasionally, of course, you can use Camo Hunter. If you want recovery and sustain and heals and all that good stuff, you can use Repentance. And if you want Execute, you can use that. But again, for the most part, we're using this. Depends on the content and your group. Now, next up is our main spammable, is in the Adric Spear skill line. First ability to unlock, starts off as Puncture and Sweep, morph it to Biting Jabs. Now, this does damage every hit for one second. It actually channels stabs, and the front target will get hit for the most damage, and everything around it will get hit as well, but for less amounts. Now, this does give us Major Savagery. We do already have it from here, but if you swap this skill out, of course, this will cover it. And not only that, this is actually on a timer, so if you activate it and then swap bars we do still have Major Savagery for the time that it's lasting. So we can do our back bar rotation, swap back to the front, we're doing our spammables, etc, etc. Swap bars, we've still got it. We can basically have 100% uptime on this uh, bonus just by using that skill. If you're using potions, yes, it's already covered, but it will fill the gaps, and you've got other bonuses as well. If you're not using potions for this, you are covered and you can use something else. So maybe you can use a different potion which will give you ultimate back or maybe a heal or something to that effect. You've got a few more options based on the fact that we have this in our rotation. So it's really, really handy. But above all, you've got to keep this up all the time. Whenever you're not doing any damage over time from skills that last a while, basically, you need to be spamming this. But it will be explained in the rotation anyway, and this is how you apply it. This guy here will get hit the hardest, and all other surrounding targets will get hit as well. So... 
Although it is your single target spammable as such, the Templar does have very, very nice AoE. So there's a lot of stuff out there about which class does what and who hits the most single target, etc, etc, etc. And it's, it's assumed that there is a best class just because some get higher numbers on single target with exactly the same setups, by the way, than others. But it's all about design. Some are designed for single target, some are designed for AoE, and some are designed for a balance of the two. And this particular class, if you're using their class skills, can actually do single target and area of effect combined. So while their single target overall may be a little bit less than some, it's because they have this benefit here. And there's a couple other skills that do that as well. But this single one here, not only benefits you, but it does benefit other people. So you help other people's single targets while contributing to a lot of AOE. Just consider that when you're talking about class identity, because there is a system in place where certain things are meant to be designed for a certain purpose and this is no different when it comes to this particular skill it's supposed to be a balance between the two now next up of course is rending slashes this is in our dual wield skill line second ability to unlock starts off as twin slashes morph into rending slashes this is single target it's a damage over time you attach it to the target and it does damage now that's very, very straightforward. It lasts for 10 seconds. It's very, very powerful, so you do want to keep this in your rotation all the time. But there is a different version of this if you prefer. If you do feel like you're a little bit squishy, you can change this to Blood Craze instead. The damage over time will be exactly the same. The initial hit will be slightly less, but you will heal over time. So the choice is yours. You can use either one of the two, but you must have this skill because it is essential to our actual setup, and that will make more sense in a bit. No spoilers, of course. In the chat, if you are watching this live on the premiere and you already know what buffs that. Some people don't. Keep watching. Now, Floor the Stormbreaker, of course, is our main ultimate our front bar. This is here just for stats, but we'll explain those in the passive section. Now, this does do really, really nice damage in front of you and does an initial hit. It's damage over time. It increases your weapon damage by 300. It's pretty good. It was really, really good on the previous setup as well. But... We're not actively using this ability. It's just here for stats. Again, when I get to the passives, that'll make more sense. But you want Flawless Dawnbreaker on your front bar. Now, the back bar. Very, very simple. Another fight is good ability right here. Now, this is the second ability you unlock. Starts off a circle of protection. Morph it to Ring of Preservation. Now, this is very, very simple. Again, it's on here mostly for stats, but it does have a benefit. If you activate this... Anyone standing inside of this will take 8% reduction to damage. They will gain 10% increased stam recovery, yourself included. And while standing in it, as you can see, I'm healing every half a second. So you heal, you and your group. Very, very strong indeed if you need it. However, if you're not comfortable with that on your bar, you don't necessarily use it as much as you could. And you just end up running around a lot and not really standing in it. You can, of course, go into the Assault Skill line and use Echo and Vigor instead. You won't get the Fighter's Guild passives. Your damage will be slightly lower. But you will obviously have an active heal, which you can use for you and others while you're on the move. So it's situational. One for stack and burn, one for moving around. But if you want the extra damage output, again, when I get to the passives, it'll make more sense. Then you want to put this on your bar. Next up, of course, is Poison Injection. This is in the Bow skill line. Last ability to unlock. Starts off as Poison Arrow, morph it to Poison Injection. Now, this does a single target damage over time to the target that is attached. Uh, this is attached to. You can put it on multiples if you want. But not only does it do damage over time for 10 seconds, but the lower the health, the stronger it gets. So this is a passive execute at the same time. Just keep the skill running the whole time, and it will get stronger and stronger by default. Don't let it run out. There's an initial hit as well, which is quite strong. So again, make sure you keep this in your rotation the whole time. The other morph of this does have a damage over time to it, just like this does, but it doesn't get stronger at low health. Instead, it applies an interrupt. So the choice for that is yours, but just consider what you're going to lose or gain if you swap this out. Next up, of course, is Blazing Spear. Now, we are using this for the damage output, but not for the damage output of the skill. Mostly for the damage output of the passive. Now what this does is, I mean, it costs 5k magicka almost already, which is quite expensive, but we do have good recovery to cover that. We use this once every rotation, but this actually applies a spear on the ground that does damage over time. It does do magic damage, which is not great for us. But a passive does apply to this, which I'll explain shortly. But above all, another massive bonus to this is that somebody else can pick it up. So I'll... Hit the dummy, actually, to give you an example. This is what you're looking for. One of those. That's exactly the same as this. And if you pick it up, you will get almost 4k of your highest resource back. So while you're in your rotation using this to do damage, other people can pick up the spear next to you and get resources back. So you're actually supplying sustain to other people at the same time. It's really, really handy. 
But again, this will make a lot more sense once we get to the passes because although we do need to keep this in our rotation and it does do a very small amount of damage, it applies to a lot more damage. Again, that will make sense in a bit. Restore and Focus is next. This is in our Restoring uh, Light skill line. The fifth ability you unlock starts off as Rune Focus, morph it to Restoring Focus. This is broken. Now, this will give you Major Resolve, which is Physical and Spell Resistance of 5280 for 20 seconds. Whether you are inside of it or not, as you can see. Resist buff puts us to 19 and 16. Spell and Physical. But... This is the only version of Major Resolve in the entire game that has a buff to it. Because if you're standing in it, it is increased by 50%. Which is why we're on 21.7 and 19.1. We are really, really, really tanky regardless of our health um, amount. It's very, very nice indeed. You must keep this up 100% of the time to keep those resistances up. You must keep inside of it if you want the 50% increase. And above all, while this is active... This is stupidly high. You have 240 stamina recovery every one second. You don't have to stand in it for that. You just have to activate it. Standing in it gives you the extra buffer resistances. Activate and it gives you that recovery. Sure, it costs 763 stamina. But after almost three seconds, you get that back anyway. And now you've got 17 seconds of just free stamina for nothing. This doesn't show in our recovery, however. As you can see here, if we put our recovery on with our potion and all that good stuff. In fact, we'll put repentance on as well. Let's say for argument's sake we're using it. You will see that we have 1,555 recovery. This 240 a second doesn't show. 240 a second translated to actual recovery because we calculate it every two seconds. Is actually 480 extra recovery. We are almost on 2k recovery flat out. It doesn't show in our stats. Got to keep this up. It's very, very strong indeed. And remember, of course, not only is that broken as hell, but if something dies, you can actually siphon stamina off of it. We're not going to run out. We've got very, very high sustain. Seen a lot of people worrying about sustain this update. First of all, it's down to your rotation. If you spam abilities and you actually spend your own stamina bar and wonder where it's gone, well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that you overspent. Maybe you need to heavy attack a bit more. But for this particular setup, we are deliberately set up with our rotation in mind to cover our sustain. We have really good sustain. Now, next up, of course, is Endless Hail. This is in our bow skill line. Second ability to unlock starts off as volley, morph it to Endless Hail. If ever I say volley, I mean this, basically, whichever morph I've chosen at the time. Now, this lasts 14 seconds. It does have a two-second delay to wind it up to start with and then last actually 12, but it does physical damage over time to all enemies caught in it. Which is all of them. They will all take damage over time. It's not capped. It's incredibly strong. But the other version of it, Arrow Barrage, does more damage in a slightly larger area of effect. But lasts a lot, lot less time-wise. In the rotation we've got, Arrow Barrage did very, very well. But it fell off too quickly. And we had too much downtime on it. This particular skill, with a slightly reduced damage output, but a longer duration actually performed better on this setup because there was no real gaps it was much smoother so i stuck with this one overall if you want to choose the other one you're more than welcome to especially aoe situations because you will gain like one or two k dps in short burst fights but overall in very long um encounters this did outperform by about 3k so this is really really nice now, next up, of course, is Empower and Sweep. This is our main ultimate, and we are going to be using it all the time. Very simple. 75 ultimate is all it costs. It's very, very cheap. It does physical damage to all targets in front of you, and it will do damage to them over time for six seconds. But the more enemies, the longer the duration. And during the duration, you will gain Empower for the whole time it is up, giving you 40% increased light attack damage. Your light attacks are very, very strong. We can use this guaranteed if you keep your rotation up properly every second rotation without fail now we're gonna do a couple of things here we're gonna first of all show you on the single dummy so i'll use it here as you can see our empower is only gonna last another five or four seconds going down and down and down and it's gonna run out at the same time as the ability does now let's build up a little bit of ultimate so we can use it again and i'll do it over there with multiple targets Let's get some ulti back. 
shouldn't take long because it's really bloody cheap. Remember for ulti game, by the way, all you need to do is one light attack or one heavy attack every eight seconds and you'll get ulti three ulti a second. Now this time, I'm going to hit multiple targets. We have 16 seconds of empower. Oh my god. In area of effect, that's disgusting. And the dot is increased as well. It will last 16 seconds if you've got loads and loads of enemies. So it's capped at six targets. But, my god. It's very, very long in terms of its duration in ad pulls. And what did I say earlier about class identity? This particular one is good with extra targets. Area of effect. So, the more targets you have, the more damage you'll do here. The more you'll get given you in power from your ultimate. And the more uptime you'll have on your light attacks to bash the crap out of this. Not physically bash, you know what I mean. And... That's something that you need to get to grips with. Also, just bear in mind, I said you can use that every second rotation, which you can. If you have multiple targets, you will actually be able to use that every second rotation, but it will barely have any downtime at all. So, the situation permitting, you can have that up for a very long period of time and add a stupid amount to your overall DPS. So, when the target dummy says X, Y, and Z, this is how much you hit, just bear in mind that that buff or debuff or bonus or whatever you want to call it, has a certain duration, where there are many enemies present, it will be a higher duration. So your single target damage will go up during those moments. So the more adds, the better. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Now, I'm going to go into passives. Adric Spear, first of all, these are important. This is why Blazing Spear is with us, because although this doesn't do a lot of damage, we do get a benefit for it. Now, this increases your critical damage by 10% and increases the amount of damage you can do to blocking targets by 10% with an Adric Beerus ability, ability slotted. So, front bar we have Bite and Jabs, so that's covered. We've got Crit on both bars. And back bar we've got Blazing Spear and Empower and Sweep. So we do have this covered regardless of which one is on, but we've got both. This will grant you minor protection for 6 seconds, reducing the damage taken by 8% if you activate an Adric Spear ability. This is really simple. We're going to have this in our front bar rotation. We've got Minor Protection. 8% reduction to damage. Now, of course, Minor Protection is covered here with Circular Protection, but it doesn't matter that we double up on it. It doesn't double stack for us, so one or the other will contribute, but this does benefit your group. However, while you're not using that, you have it anyway. Now, what do we do when we swap bars and it falls off? Oh no, we're going to get hit really hard on the back bar. No, we're not, because we're using this. And that applies it as well. So we use this on the front to keep it up, and we use this on the back to keep it up. So we're covered. We have minor protection 100% of the time, as long as you keep up your rotation. Stupidly strong. Got high enough resist anyway, but there you go. Very, very powerful. This is very important. When you deal damage with an Adric Spear ability, you have a 25% chance to deal additional physical or magic, which is direct damage, by the way, but whichever one of the two is higher is the one you will get. For us, we are spec for physical damage, so obviously we'll get the physical version, and that can crit as well. And this can happen once every 0.5 seconds. Now... This here lasts a second, so it could fire twice from that. This here, this also counts. So, yes, this does do magic damage every one second, but every tick of this could proc the physical damage output of this. And, of course, since there's a 0.5 second cooldown, this can apply it, and this can apply it, and with them overlapping, we increase our chances of making it happen. Very, very nice indeed. And, of course, our ultimate also contributes. So if you're using all three of these, so the ultimate's running, this is running, and this is running, you have a hugely heightened chance to increase that. So make sure you get that passive. It's very, very important. Now, this increases your weapon damage by 6% and spell resistance by 2640. That's why our spell resistance is higher than our physical. But our weapon damage is very, very high as well. So that's really, really nice. Dawn's Wrath, of course, you won't need necessarily all of these, but they are important. This increases duration of Sunfire, Eclipse, Solar Flare, and Nova abilities. If you're using any of those, of course, that will increase them, especially if you're using Nova for mitigation purposes. Maybe you need that in your group and you have to slot it. That will increase the duration, which is quite nice. Uh, casting a Dawn's Wrath ability generates three ultimate, and this can happen once every six seconds. So if that wasn't painfully obvious, if you use a Dawn's Wrath ability, which is this, every six seconds, so basically every time that explodes, if it goes boom, cast another one, you will get ultimate. And this lasts 6 seconds. So if you keep this up 100% of the time with no 
gaps or forcing it to go too early, you will guaranteed get three ultimate every six seconds on top of your passive ulti regen. And with an ultimate that costs only 75 points, that's really, really handy. So definitely get this. Uh, when casting the Dawn's Wrath ability, you grant minor sorcery to you and your group for 20 seconds. Now, this does require spell damage to make it stronger. So, this will be slightly heightened, which is not that important for us because we're not really focusing on the magic damage. We're focusing on the physical that comes from it. However, at the same time as giving us a minor bonus, it does actually give the entire group increased spell damage. So, if you've got loads of magic or DPS people with you, not only are you um, debuffing the target with minor breach here from this skill, but you're also giving them extra damage so you've got to keep up with dawn's wrath ability all the time and lucky for you it's in our rotation 100 percent of the time so this will never ever run out reduce the health magicka stamina and ultimate cost of all your abilities by five percent very important of course got to get it now restore and light of course this increases the healing effects from your store and light abilities by up to 12 percent in the proportion to the severity of the target's wounds we're not using any heals are we yes we are if you use repentance there is a heal attached to this and this will buff it while standing in your own cleansing ritual, rune focus, which is our resistance buff or right of passage areas of effect for up to four seconds after leaving them, you will gain minor mending, increasing all of your healing done by 8%. So any healing you do at all, whether it be a proc, a passive, or this, will count if you stay in your rune and up to four seconds after leaving it. So this is very important. It says restoring aura duration, but we don't actually have the duration version. There is one that actually applies um, magic steel in area of effect. This will obviously work towards that, but we're not. So you don't need any of these. This increases your res speed by 20% with the fastest res on the field, except for a necro ulti. And of course, when you res people, they come back with 100% more health. So instead of being really, really squishy when they get up and requiring a big heal, they have a lot more health. And this gives you a 50% chance to fill a soul gem. So it costs you a soul gem, but you might get one back. Now, we're not using two-hand, we're using dual wield. Where are we? Here we are. This is very important, of course. This will increase your damage done against targets that are under 25% health by 20% with your dual wield skills. That's very specific. This is dual wield. So is this if you're using it, and so is your light and heavy attacks. So bear in mind, those abilities will be affected. This increases your offhand weapon damage by 6%. Main hand is stronger. Offhand is weaker. This will push it up a little bit. This reduces the stamina cost of dual world abilities. We obviously want them down. We're only using one or two if we're using spin to win, but keep the cost down. It helps you sustain. We do more damage with dual world attacks against CC'd targets. And this is a bonus for whatever weapon types you're holding. Each one will give you one of these bonuses depending on its type. For this particular build, we are deliberately using two daggers. We have a massive crit bonus in our passives. We have a massive crit bonus with our beast trap. We do excel at crit damage. And out of multiple tests, there was quite a substantial difference with axe and dagger, sword and dagger, all that kind of stuff. All the different variations. With this build specifically, two daggers was much, much stronger to increase that massive chance of putting out those big hits. Really did help, especially in area of effect as well, when you've got multiple targets that can be crit at once. Bow, of course, you want every single one of these. This increases the damage done to targets at long range. You may be long range with your bow inside certain mechanics, so this will help. This increases your crit rating on your bow bar. This will reduce the cost of all your abilities with your bow skills. Now, every light or heavy attack you do with your bow will increase your bow abilities, including the lights and heavies, by 5%, stacking up to 5 times. Each light or heavy will contribute to this. Now, it only lasts 5 seconds, so each light attack will reapply it and start the timer again, but as soon as you stop doing light attacks or heavy attacks with your bow, then you will lose the stacks. So, we won't get the full advantage of this, but we'll get about 3 or 4 ticks out of this every time we go to our back bar, and it will carry over to our front to continue doing that extra damage before it falls off. So, you do want to pay attention to your light attacks, especially since we empower them with our ultimate. You want to make sure your light attacks are clean. I see a lot of people doing rotations trying to panic and press skills really, really fast. Two things to consider. One, you can't press the skills any faster than they can be applied. So it doesn't matter how quick you press the buttons, there is a timer. There's a global cooldown between skills. You can't make them any quicker. Secondly, if you try and go too fast, you will miss your light attacks. You don't want to do that. Your light attacks should be focused heavily. Force the light attack out, then worry about the skill. Make sure they connect. Finally, hasty retreat, of course, for the bow skill. If you dodge roll on the bow, you run faster for four seconds. Just bear in mind, of course, if you dodge roll too quickly, one after the other, it will cost you more per dodge roll if they're within four seconds of each other, and eventually you'll run out of stamina, so don't spam it. 
We're not using any light armor, so you can ignore this, but there is a choice to have light armor. So, if you do have one piece, get these three passives. I won't go into these because we're not demonstrating this, but these are minor bonuses you can take if you choose to go with 511. We're not, but you can. We're using seven medium, so you want every single one of these. This will increase your weapon crit per piece. This will increase your stam recovery and reduction to cost per piece. This will reduce the cost of sneak if you want to use that. This will increase your weapon damage by 15%. And this will increase the movement speed bonus that you get um, for each piece worn and reduction to cost for dodge roll. So very, very handy indeed. Again, we're not using any heavy either. But if you are using the 511 variation of it, you need to get these three passives here. Not these because they require five pieces. So the first three. I won't go into them again because we're not using them. But you want those if you choose to go 511. I don't want to spoil the gear just yet, but there is a choice. You want stage two or higher for Vampire to get stam recovery and mag recovery of 10%. And also you want the undef passage for stage three or higher. I'm stage four all the time. It's up to you what you have. It's entirely up to you. I'm comfortable with stage four. Simple as that. But if you want to go lower, you can. But just bear in mind, these passes require a certain stage. So three or above, you will actually take less damage while under 50% health up to a 33% reduction. So your survival is very, very high if you have this passive. Um, we do need Fighters Guild passives, of course. I did mention those earlier. This here, this here, and this here are going to benefit from this because Intimidating Presence, first of all, reduces the cost of these two abilities. So you're going to want that. But this one increases your weapon damage for each skill on your bar. This is the important one. One, two, and three. So if you have Repentance, you lose 3% weapon damage. Just bear that in mind, but your sustain will go up. But if you have Beast Trap, this, and Flawless Dawnbreaker on your bar... Each one will give you 3% increase. And on the back, as you can see, our heal is actually from the Fighter's Guild passive. Our beneficial reduction to damage support ability for the group and heal actually does count from this skill line. So it is a 3% increase on your back bar. So if you have Vigor, you lose 3%. If you have this, you keep it. It's up to you. It's a choice. This is very important. You generate 9 ultimate when you kill an undead Daedra or Werewolf. We're going to kill a lot of things. Our ultimate is really, really cheap. The more enemies, the longer our ultimate lasts. The more ultimate we get back, the more often we can spam it. Where I said you can use it every second rotation, you may use it every rotation, depending on what you're killing, which could give you 100% uptime on Empower, which is insane. So you need this passive. Also, your Fighter's Guild abilities deal an additional 20% damage against Undead, Daedra, or Werewolves. This is a damage ability we are utilizing, so that will be stronger for those targets. You're going to want Undaunted, of course. This will give you 4% all of your resources back if you take a synergy. Take every one you can see. They give you damage output. They give you shields. They give you heals. They give you all manner of beneficial stuff to you and your group. Make sure you take every single one of them. And this is the funny thing about this particular setup. You know those tanks out there that scream that they can't sustain because people keep picking up the spears and it's not fair? First of all, those are for everyone. Secondly, well, they don't need to cry near you because look. You're throwing the spears. Doesn't matter if you pick one up or not. They can take yours. Just saying. And, of course, you are going to want Undaunted Metal. Now, for this particular build, we are using 7 medium, so we get a 2% bonus across the board. However, if you do choose to go 5-1-1, which you can, so 1 heavy, 1 light, 5 medium, you will get a 6% bonus across the board. The choice is actually yours. Both versions of the setup are very, very strong, but just bear in mind, of course, the sustain is easier with 7 medium. If you never run out of sustain, if you are absolutely spot on with it, of course go 511. You're going to have more health, more stamina, and more mag, and that means you're going to have a higher damage output and higher survivability. But this is a choice. Depends on how you feel about playing the class. Or the build, rather. Um, we are, of course, an orc. This increases our max stamina. This increases our max health, and we heal once every four seconds from our weapon abilities. So our volley, our poison injection, our rend and slashes, or our light or our heavy attacks with either weapon. And this increases our flat weapon damage and increases our speed and reduction to sprint cost. Very, very strong indeed. You can choose any race you want. This one did deal the most flat out damage overall if you're going straight up burn the target to bits. But other races are very, very good as well. Khajiit is great for the extra crit damage, although it wasn't necessarily higher. Had nice recovery. The Wood Elf, by the way, you are never, ever going to run out of stamina. Their recovery is insane. So if you're one of those people that just doesn't want to ever run out, go Wood Elf. It's absolutely fine. Get slight damage drop, but you're going to be in the fight forever. 
However, the Orc worked out very, very well, especially since the Templar generally does have very good sustain if you're utilizing certain passives and skills. So I'm more than comfortable with this. The choice is yours, however. And finally, the most important passive in the game, medicinal use. Any potions you use will be 30% longer. I'm using weapon pots with brutality, savagery, and um, endurance. And they last 47 seconds, not 36, which means they're longer than my cooldown. So I can keep them active 100% of the time, and you should. People that are using potions just when they're low are doing it wrong. Keep your potions running. Now, I'm going to go into the gear. Now... Before you panic about what I'm about to show you, I'm first of all going to show you the optimal setup. And during that, I'm going to explain what you can do to swap stuff out if you don't have access to this. There are some very, very solid options that are really close in terms of damage output. So, first of all, we're using two Master's Daggers. You can use a sword and an axe, or two swords, or two axes, or whatever you want, but the two daggers did end up on top so if you can get them two daggers there's a vdsa guide on my channel if you are unsure about how to complete vet dragon star arena now this one needs to be nern honed on the main hand you need sharpened on the off hand i am using poisons of course double dot poisons but you don't have to if you don't want to if you do you are going to have more single target damage but if you don't you've got some glyph choices and that is entirely up to you but this increases the strength of every single tick of your twin slashes twin slashes is Rending slashes, the one we've got here. Starts off as twin slashes, we've morphed it to rending. That gets stronger with these weapons. So it's our main single target damage over time, aside from poison injection, and it does boost it by quite a lot. In fact, without these, there's about 5k difference. So it's pretty substantial. Now, this is our back bar weapon. I know lots of people have been using the Master's Bow, and myself included on some particular setups out there, but this outperformed on this build heavily. Again, another 5 to 6k DPS overall. Because we do have very, very high crit damage. And this does tick rather rapidly and progressively gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. If you're using a Master's Bow on this particular build, it turned out that your overall damage output kind of stagnated with the extra 301 weapon damage and was, was pretty good. But because this still escalated, that very strong damage over time ability, which did get boosted up again from the first week of PTS when it was um, being tested, this actually outperformed on this build. Other builds, not so much. It was a little bit lower. But this did really, really skyrocket the DPS. Now, if you don't have access to these just yet, do not worry. What you can do instead is you can put agility on both bars, giving you a massive stamina bonus because it did get buffed to almost 2k just for two pieces. And you will do just fine. You will have a drop in damage, but it will still be no problem for all content. And you can use those while farming these. Now, we are, of course, using five pieces of Reliquin. You'll notice that I've got the helmet on here. It doesn't have to be the helmet and shoulders and all that stuff. Just as long as you've got five pieces. If you use a perfected version, you'll have 1k extra stamina. If you have the regular version, you just have 1k less stamina. Apart from that, the set does the same. You'll get two crit bonuses, minus layer, and every stack of wind that you apply to the target. So every one second, your light attack or heavy attack will add another one, stacking up to 20. You will do damage, basically. So the longer it is, the, the stronger it is. But you see the spin in there. Add another one and another one. And it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. But if you don't keep that up, five seconds of it will fall off. And the whole thing's gone. You have to keep up a light or heavy every five seconds. If you're in mechanics and you have to go backwards with your bow, just remember once every five seconds at most, not at least, at least is one second, you have to keep up those lights. If you can't do that, practice or take it off. Because... That is a massive amount of your DPS. Just that proc alone. It's absolutely mental. Some people can use it. Some people can't. It can be quite difficult. Practice or take it off. If you take it off, there's many, many other sets you can use. I'm going to get to a swap out in just a second after we get to the second set. You want Divines on everything, by the way. The other set is crafted. We're using New Moon Acolyte in medium. Now, this will give you a weapon crit bonus. A spell crit bonus. A weapon damage bonus, a spell damage bonus, physical penetration, and spell penetration. So it's across the board for everyone. You can use this on anything. And it increases your weapon damage and your spell damage before by 481. So it's huge. It increases all of our physical stuff, and any magic stuff that we're doing does get a little bit of a kick. 
Now, the only downside to this is it increases the cost of all your active abilities by 5%. But we already have a 5% reduction to all of our abilities. So we, we break even. On a Templar, we just break even. And because we've got so much recovery in our skills and our passives and our bonuses, you don't even notice this. This topped out. So this here, Reliquent and this combined, topped out. At best case scenario, single target on the dummy, considering, yes, there are some variables missing and it's not always that accurate. You're talking anywhere between 77 and 80k. However, if you go 511, you can actually get a little bit more than that. So this is a very, very strong combination. It worked really, really well and did outperform versus Briarheart. However, if you don't have access to Reliquin, you're scared to do trials and you're not quite comfortable jumping into pugs or even hosting them on normal to get the regular version of this, you can swap this out for Briarheart. So you can actually stack the two together. So you can use New Moon Acolyte and Briarheart combined or New Moon and Reliquin combined. Just bear in mind, of course, when I spoke about the 511 stuff earlier, you can change this out. Because we're using seven medium, obviously we don't have one heavy, one light, but this is crafted. So if you wanted to, you could go with a light belt and a heavy chest and get the most optimal stats that you can get as long as you can sustain it. So that's a choice for you also. Just bear in mind, of course, the jewelry is three bloodthirsty, all with weapon damage. Now, I'm going to go into the champion points and I'm going to quickly explain the rotation. Red stuff is the same as every other one of my builds. You can change it as much as you want, depending on the content. But flat out, this is a very good balance. 23% of 72 points into Ironclad to reduce the amount of direct damage you take. 64 and 64 into Hardening Elemental Defender, so we've got a 13% reduction to all damage. Now, I did a lot of testing with this, especially with popular stuff that came out recently where people trying to test this out and saying you need 52, not 51. False. If you're doing actual damage over time, you need 51, you'll get the 19%. 52 won't give it to you. Some of the tests have been inaccurate um some have tried to duel each other and put down wall of elements sure dueling will show you that the damage over time difference will be there but lightning wall of elements can proc concussion which is minor vulnerability increasing the damage output so the tests are going to be inconclusive if one uh has it and the other doesn't and also burning status effect from the flame wall of elements is also a bad test because if you apply a burning status effect to the target your wall of elements now does 20 percent more so maybe your 51 you got hit with the burning status effect so you got hit harder and your 52 it didn't apply and you got hit less that's a fluctuating effect a variable that is somewhat skewed and you need to do something much much more flat so it did test it and it's actually the same uh, 51 and 52 anyway unchained passive of course we do get access to for this tree because we've got so many points in here and this will make sure that if you do break free your next ability that you cast with stamina will be 80 percent cheaper so make sure it's something really really expensive 90 points into quick recovery to increase our healing received. And of course, we've got the field physician passive where we take less damage if we resurrect someone while you're resing. We do res very, very fast. So during that phase, you'll take less damage. 44 points into warlord to reduce the cost of break free. 75 in tenacity to increase the amount of stamina we get back from our heavy attacks. And 75 into mooncalf to increase our stamina recovery by 14% as well. 72 into tumbling to reduce the cost of dodge roll. And of course... Four points into Shadow Ward. This is only a 1% bonus because we didn't quite hit the two, but we've got nothing else we can do with this anyway, so we might as well spend the points in this. And we get Treasure Passive, meaning higher quality loot from chests. Nothing in here. 14 into Physical Weapons Expert. And 61 into Master of Arms. Now, previously, we had a lot, lot less in Master of Arms because Biting Jabs was one of those awkward hybrid skills that wasn't quite sure if it was a dot or direct damage. Zoss have now finally fixed that and decided that it's direct damage. So we've boosted all of our direct damage as much as possible for our light attacks, our heavy attacks if we're using them, and our jabs because they are our main spammables and they will contribute quite a lot. 56 and 2 damage over time in Thermoturge. We are still using a fair amount of, of damage over time. Our Poison Injection, our Rend and Slashes especially because of our Master Weapon. Our uh, Volley because of our Maelstrom Weapon. We are actually still pushing really high dot damage. So you do want to make sure you get some points into this. Precise Strikes, we've only got 40 in here rather than 61 that I would normally put in. Basically because um, I normally push to hit 100%. But we've got an extra 10% with our own class passive anyway so i brought this down a little bit 35 into piercing now we do have penetration on our weapon and we do have it in our set as well so this is lower than my other setups because we actually have the same penetration as those but some of it is in our gear so we have accounted for all possible uh buffs and debuffs being applied so we can actually hit 18200 on the nose 
Mighty, of course, 64 points in here because if you go too much into dot, it's too selective. If you go too much into direct, it's too selective. And the same for crit damage as well. We're going to end up using a lot of points for 1% in something rather than an extra 1% in everything. So where I would normally go to 49 here and then maybe go to 56 on others for the 1%, we've actually got a 2% increase on bonus damage here for everything that we do versus my other setups by going into 13% here instead of 11. So this is very, very nice indeed. Um, now we're going to go over the rotation. And this is going to take a bit of practice because you need to make sure that you do apply your light attacks. They are crucial. This is more important than this. Sure, you need the skill to apply, but you need to make sure you hit your light attack. So when you're doing jabs, make sure you light attack, hit, light attack, hit quite quickly. It doesn't look like I'm swinging it, but I am. So light, stab to start with. Then when you get really good at it, you won't even see it. Light, hit. Light, hit. You'll hear him do it, but you won't see it. Make sure that does apply, though. And it looks like this. If I try and do it, but it doesn't work, you'll just see the jab. Light attack jab, however, listen very carefully. You can hear it. Not only that, you can see the wind applied. So if you miss your light attacks, you lose your empowered hit. If you miss your light attacks, you lose your reliquin proc. So make sure they hit. Anyway, to keep things simple, make sure your rune focus is down. And make sure your beast trap is down. That's it. You want your buff from this and the damage. And you want your resistance from this and your recovery. Once they're down, volley, light attack, poison injection, light attack, blazing spear, swap bars. Very simple. Now, your first rotation, you want your ultimate if you've got it. So you would actually fire this, then light, then spear, then ultimate, then swap. If it's available. If it's not available, same order with volley, light, poison, light. But now you want to squeeze in your rune focus. So light attack, rune focus, light attack, blazing spear, swap bars. So... One rotation, you want to finish with your ultimate. The other rotation, you want your rune focus down just before the spear swap. Now, front bar is relatively simple too. Light attack, power of the light. While that's up, light attack, rend and slashes. Light attack, stab three times. Boom, it's gone. Reapply it. Light attack, beast trap, swap. So to recap, power of the light first. Light attack, rend and slashes. Light attack, jabs three times. When that explodes, light attack, power, light attack, beast trap, swap. Now we're going to do it on dummy. I'm going to give you a quick demonstration. I'm going to exclude the light attacks from my explanation. So when I say light, I mean this. Power of the light. If I say that. But anyway, make sure your buffs are up. Volley, poison, spear, ultimate, swap. Light, slashes, jabs three times. Light's going to explode, reapply it, beast trap, swap, volley, poison, rune, spear, swap, repeat, light, slashes, jabs, 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 it's going to go boom, reapply it, beast trap, swap, volley, light, spear, <laughs> ultimate, I said light then, I meant light attack, that confused you. Right, basically, those abilities in that order every single time. It never, ever, ever, ever changes. Not even at execute. Keep it exactly the same forever. You get your muscle memory figured out for that. You won't ever have to change your rotation. You won't struggle with it, and it'll be very, very simple to apply. Just bear in mind, you must light attack between every skill. Even this one, even the beast trap, swap, even the spear, and swap. Now, your swaps you can make quite quick. Beast trap and swap bar really fast. Spear, swap bar really fast. Try and swap while it's in the air. That way it will make your rotation smoother. Everything will line up perfectly. Gonna take a bit of practice, but everything is pretty much done for you. Just keep at it. Remember, of course, you do have really good AoE. So let's just bear this in mind for a moment. You have these here. Which are all gonna get hit with area of effect constantly. Remember, it's not just a single target setup. So, hopefully that helped. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. And hopefully you have a better understanding of how to approach this particular build. Just going to show a quick screenshot of what to expect once you've got your rotation down. You can go higher than this. You may go lower. It just means you have to practice a little bit. That's all. The dummy isn't 100% accurate anyway because in content, you're going to have minor courage. You're going to have maybe minor slayer if someone else is supplying that, perhaps from War Machine or Master Architect. You're going to have major vulnerability if you've got Necros in your group. You are going to hit actually quite a bit higher if you've got your buffs and bonuses in. But that doesn't mean you're going to go top end all the time. 
the overall top highest numbers you've ever seen on dummy are not what you normally expect in content very few people actually do it and although that number specifically has come down the average dps for what you will do in content is about the same as it ever was before so Again, hopefully that helped. Hopefully it wasn't too confusing and hopefully you can take something from this. Enjoy the build. And of course, if you are not subscribing on YouTube, please do hit that button. It is free. There's a new membership system on YouTube as well. So there's loads and loads of tiers there with extra perks. Also, if you want to help support outside of the channel, there are some links in the info section for Patreon, Twitter, Facebook, and of course the website zynodegaming.com. Once again, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.